Good morning. Hey, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Judy, uh, yes. Hi. Hello. Hi, uh, Dr. Oh, Baker. I had, I had uh, the wrong, my wrong Zoom meeting open, so I was in another meeting, and there was no one there. I was like, this is weird. And so I realized I was in my consult meeting, and then we've got uh, people coming to fix our air conditioner, so there's people that just arrive right at the exact same minute it was supposed to start, so I apologize for that. First of all, um, welcome. Uh, I've got a little bit of a scratchy voice. I was at jujitsu yesterday getting strangled a whole bunch, and whenever I get strangled a lot, it usually messes up your throat. So you can't, your, your voice is kind of scratchy, but uh, I'm trying to get better lighting in here. I'm staring from a mirror, hope our window rather. Hopefully, this is uh, maybe a little better for those that haven't commented on that. We'll work, work around that. So, anyway, welcome, guys. Uh, so, Judy and Laura, for those who don't know you, please provide a quick little Two minute summary of who you guys are, just in case those people that are watching this on YouTube or uh, you know in the community have not seen you before. Sure, I, I'll go first. Um, I'm Judy Cho, also known as Nutrition with Judy. I'm basically a nutritional therapist that's a big advocate of a meat only elimination diet to get to root cause healing. My name is Laura Spath, and I just am a carnivore, living the lifestyle of being a carnivore now for almost four years. Uh, Judy and I met through Instagram and do a podcast together now. And so we just uh, kind of have been doing this a diet for a long time. My husband, my kids, my mom, our whole family. Okay. I was wondering where the connection was. I didn't realize you guys were doing a podcast together now. So I was, I was like, well, I know Judy, I know Laura. I didn't know they, te they had teamed up in a way. Well, great, great. That's good to hear. Um, I, I guess, Judy, I'm gonna, I'll start with you. I mean, you obviously have, uh, there's a lot of different, theories and philosophies and you know sort of sort of people a lot of people are discussing on you know how to do a carnivore diet properly or optimally and, and you know and, and, and I know you've been someone like myself who says you know I don't think this is a something uh, you know uh, well I'll just get into it I mean a lot of people say you know you have to eat liver every day and there's people that are saying now you have to have fruit in the diet to make it optimal or to make it so you don't get sick well, either I'll open you guys up to that because I think that's something a lot of people want to want to discuss, you know, uh, in this in this topic. So, what are you guys' thoughts around those types of things? Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, I'll. I don't think you need it. Um, so, when I wrote the Carnivore Cure, I did a lot of nutrient density infographics and research and liver is undeniably one of the most nutrient dense foods but as i work with clients and they are almost all exclusively meat only or 95 percent meat based and i started seeing people not feeling well and i naturally a student and a learner and so i'm like why are they not getting better and as i did some digging i noticed that a lot of these people there's a kind of a typical person where um, they're eating a lot of liver. And so once we started doing their hair mineral test, and I know there are people that argue that, oh, that's not really um, a good test, but their copper and their chromium was extremely high. And those were the big tickers. So then when I started looking into liver, I noticed that they are really high. I think three ounces of beef liver, it has like a thousand, 1100% of your daily value. So in three ounces, you're getting that much. And then I also noticed that the chromium's high. And then I started looking into vitamin A because vitamin A is also a very, very, um, I would say almost excessive nutrient in a um, in liver. And so it just started going down the rabbit hole. Um, we store our fat soluble vitamins in our liver. So if you are coming to a meat only or a meat based carnivore diet and you don't have good liver health, there is a chance that you are inundating your liver to now also store um, all these excess nutrients that it can't really do, then it can't really, um, um, it can't re reduce and remove the estrogen in your body. And then if you also have thyroid issues, the T4 is converted to T3 in the thyroid. So all of these things now, to me, I realize for someone that's maybe under eating anorexic, maybe they'll do good with liver, but other people, we have to get nuanced here where most people don't need liver every day. I don't think the tribes and our ancestors ate liver every day for a, uh, for muscle meat of 600 pounds from a cow, there's maybe 20 pounds of liver. So if you think of that proportion, that makes more sense compared to people I'll see online eating like 10 ounces of liver with some fruit. Um, and so to bring up the fruit, the other thing about liver is that an organ meats are, they are very, very high in purines, meaning that when meat breaks down, they have DNA and it 
produces periods, which if you suffer from gout, that can be a risk for you. Um, the other part of that is now the fruit. So that whole cycle of the uric acid cycle that produces gout that can facilitate gout, um, that whole pathway can cause more metabolic syndrome. And on my channel in a couple of weeks, uh, I'm interviewing someone that's an expert in this field. And so they recommend no organ meats and they also say limited, limited fruits. So, or sorry, fructose. So the concern with a meat-based diet is if you're eating a lot of meats and fats, which your energy is coming from fatty acids to add fructose to that load may actually be more risky than for even a standard American diet. So no, I do not think at all that people should be eating much fruit. Now, if you want berries occasionally after your meal, fine. If you could tolerate it, if you can mentally handle it, totally fine. But I do not think you need fruit. And I absolutely don't think it's really beneficial. Um, and then in terms of organ meats, I think people should be very cautious with the amount that they consume of it. Yeah, and, and, and Laura, I want to, I'll get to your response in a second, but just to, just to follow up on a point, Judy, I mean, there are a lot of people that say that there's nothing wrong with fruit. You can eat as much as you want. No, no one ever got eating fruit. Fruit is a health food. You sh we should never demonize that. There's other studies out there show that there's like a fructose limit for some people. And, yeah. and again, I think it, it, it tends to be sort of user dependent to some degree, but uh, um, I mean, by your sort of prediction, then we should see people that are eating a carnivore diet with lots of fruit are we expecting them to develop metabolic disease and gout? And obviously, are we seeing that? I mean, because at the end of the day, I'm like, well, what are the results? I don't care what, sure. the, what the mechanisms are, what the theories are. What are the actual results we're seeing? And, and that's kind of been my guiding heuristic from the beginning. Sure. And, and so are we seeing that? Yeah, are we seeing some of the things that you're, you're, you're describing yes. as potential problems? Yes. Yeah, so the only reason I started looking into gout is I have some clients that are like, um, I had gout in remission and all of a sudden on a carnivore diet, it's coming back, it's flaring back. So what is going on? And so what I do on my channel is interview people that are specialists in these areas and ask, what are the mechanisms? What are all the different nuances of this can happen? And I think there is a risk. So if you think about a meat only diet, most people come to this way of eating because they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so there will often be levels of metabolic syndrome, meaning hyperinsulinemia, excess glucose, excess insulin. And so for those bodies, maybe this added layer is not ideal. And so it'll really depend on the person. Um, funny thing is lately I've been sharing about this since that uh, interview is coming up. And so I've been sharing and as I share in my stories, other people are coming to me saying, I heard that you know, fruit is necessary on this way of eating and I've been eating it. And then in three, four months, my mental health is declining. And there are numerous people coming to me. And not only that, it's also my clients. So some people will say, I wanted to add one piece of fruit just to see if I'm metabolically flexible, if I'm healthy, um, if I can handle it. And now I'm binging off of other foods. So we have to understand the population. I mean, majority of America is obese. So I don't think majority of the people are these metabolically super healthy people that are saying, no, I don't think I'm going to eat a little bit of fruit today, or I'm not going to eat a little bit of this and have that level of restraint. Otherwise, realistically, they wouldn't be doing a meat based diet. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's a nice nuance and caveat to saying, who is your population? Or do we have right. these insulin resistant, um, you know, people that are, that have issues with uh, food addictions and so on and so forth. So Laura, um, you like Judy says she helps people and you're one of these people that has been helped by a carnivore diet. I mean, you had this tremendous, uh, just breathtaking transformation you put up on the line that caught a lot of people's attention, including mine, you know, a couple of years ago and you've sort of uh, had that journey and I know you've had some ups and downs in there, but what's going on with you these days and, and what has been your experience with, have you done organ meats and fruit and all that stuff or where, where are you at right now with regard to carnivore? Okay, sorry. It was I. Yeah, I was hitting unmute and it wouldn't let me. Um, so that's kind of it. Like, uh, you know, Judy has the nutritional side, and why she and I kind of talk about a lot on the podcast is like, how does real life fit into that? And like, yeah, we know all this information, but like, how does somebody like me who's trying to live this lifestyle because I was, I was 
fat, sick and tired and like unhealthy and had all these issues. And like, how do I balance real life? And anytime that I try to deviate from a carnivore diet is the times that I've had those setbacks or the times that I've had those ups and downs. And so, you know, right now my fam, our whole family is in a really great place. Like my, I, my health has improved. The weight loss has mean is kind of stabilizing. I'm finding that happy place for that. And I cannot under any circumstances incorporate fruit. My addict brain, my carb addicted sugar brain says, um, this is let's get a cupcake instead, or let's have strawberry shortcake instead of strawberries or this, you know, these other treats. I'm not a fit, metabolically healthy man who lives in the tropics that can get seasonal fruit on a daily basis and works out all the time. You know, I'm somebody who's still trying to reverse a lot of that metabolic disease and can't handle the sugar cravings. And so while my kids are somebody who are healthy and can handle fruit occasionally, I can't, nor do I think that it would be helpful for my physical or mental standpoint. And kind of like with the same thing with organs, I wouldn't be able to maintain this diet if I had to choke them down. Like I don't find them appetizing. I couldn't even eat them. I don't want to cook them. Um, and I can't imagine that even ancestrally, like people would be scar, you know, like forcing themselves to eat something that tastes bad the same way. We don't eat a lot of plants that taste bad and bitter and have those awful tastes. Like, so in almost four years now of being carnivore, I've never had organ meats. Um, and I think I can balance finding nutrition by eating a variety of regular meats. You know, I eat some fish, I eat uh, seafood, I guess, and lots of pork and beef and chicken and kind of all of those things combined. And I'm at, at a place now where the longer that I'm carnivore, the healthier I am and the easier it is to maintain that. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on the, I don't like the way organ meats taste. I've, I've tried to eat them. I've experimented with them and I've just continuously, one, not seen any sort of improvement in my health. And two, I just don't like them. And I, and I, and I just maintain that no one is going to sustain a diet where you don't like what you're eating. And I, I don't think that's right. how anyone is designed. The reason we're not eating poisonous, bitter, you know, leaves and stuff like that is because it's physically not good for us. And, right. and you know, it's, it's kind of debatable if organ meats have a deleterious effect. I know Judy's gone into vitamin A toxicity that some people get when they're eating these massive amounts. And I think the point she makes about the size of an animal, and you know, if you go back even further to these giant megafaunal animals where you've got not 600 pounds of meat, but maybe, you know, 10,000 pounds of meat on a giant mastodon, and you've got, you know, a liver that will rot very quickly. This is the other problem. They don't preserve very well. And so they have to eat them on the spot if they're gonna eat them at all. And then what the meat they bring back is not going to be that. So majority of the people aren't going to have access to them and we use it we conflate this hunter gather modern indigenous tribe situation where everybody there has largely been pushed to the sort of the, the, the most remote areas on on the planet that no one wants to go to where they're 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 scraping by to, to just to get enough food in many cases and that is not the situation that that early man found himself in when there was kind of a, a plethora of these megafaunal animals i mean they, the archaeologic record is very clear on that we had just tons and tons and tons of megafaunal animals everywhere. And they were not that difficult for us to kill, particularly as we got, you know, we used our brain and our cooperative hunting and tool usage to, to kill these things. So that's, that's a good point. And, you know, like I said, I, I think if you're going to eat liver, you should maybe eat it in an appropriate size of an animal. I mean, the only way, some of these recommendations that I've seen, you know, you eat, you know, six ounces a day or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, then you're saying, well, you'd have to have a cow with like six or seven livers to be able to do that. And they don't, they don't come that way. So um, I think the majority of people, you, sorry, I think the majority of people too are living on processed foods and carbs and fast food and, you know, things from the inside of the grocery store and boxed meals. At least that's my experience. That's what my family was doing. And so if you had told me from the very beginning that I had to eat organs in order to join this diet or lose weight or be healthy, I'd say, forget it. Just let me keep the pizza because it was just not going to happen. And so when that you must do this because it's, you know, has this vitamin in it. Like I wasn't getting any vitamins eating Twinkies either. And so um, it's just kind right. of, it makes it so, it makes it so far unattainable for like the average person trying to heal themselves. And one thing I yeah, want to I mean, say about the ancestral thoughts is that, you know, there's a lot of people that'll say the first thing that animals go for are the organs, but is it really the organs? If you think about all the organs, there's protected by fat, right? We know that suet is around kidneys. So are they really going for the fat or is it the organs? And these are things that we really need to consider when we're talking about, 
I know there's a lot of ancestral um, communities that eat organs. I get that. And I'm not saying all organs. I'm really speaking of liver and kidneys. I think all the other organs are super nutrient dense. Heart is so similar to muscle meat. It doesn't really taste bad. There's a lot of CoQ10. I can go through all the lists. So all of those are good, but I think we should be cautious um, with the vitamin A. I mean, I'm sorry, with the liver and the kidneys. I mean, they are part of our detox pathways. I know there's arguments where people will say, well, they don't store it. Well, when you are processing an animal, how do you know it's not part of the time period where it was actually doing the processing? We don't know when they process the animal, what was in there and even what part of the liver was given. I mean, there's often times where animals are sick and then they just say, okay, let's just hide this part of the parasite or the worm. And then we'll just give the part that looks healthy. How do you know that you're eating a high quality unless you're getting it from your farmer? So there's all these things to think about. And it's just, I think there's this, I get it, it's nutrient dense, but there's an, there are reasons why our RDAs and our dietitians they give upper limits of nutrition. And it's because you can get sick and the vitamin A levels, even one ounce for a child under three is up above that upper limit. And to me, that is so frightening that we are giving babies and children, the first foods is liver when their liver is not even fully developed before the age of three. And so I fed my child that too, because I believed it too. And now I wonder, was I poisoning his liver? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, Moving on. I, yeah, I think, I think you know, again, whether these are things that we just need to discuss. And, and yeah. you know, I think there's something that, like I said, I always find when anybody says you must do this, I, I'd like to see the data show me something that can that can prove that. And, and again, there's not a lot of studies on on this diet. And the one study that's out, well, not one. There's there's several. There's 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 a handful. There's you know six, eight, ten studies now that have looked at carnivore diets in various capacities for different reasons. Some of them are case reports. Uh, you know, the Harvard study that came out. I, Zoe Harcom just did a nice review of that, which I'll share with somebody uh, at one at another time. But one of the things that the Harvard study did, and they specifically, if you read the body of the text, they say they noted no difference in any sign of nutrient deficiency, whether people included organ meats or not. And so I think that's a telling outcome. And that's consistent with the results I've seen over collecting, you know, data. I've got data on 12,000 people that have done this diet. And the same thing, it didn't seem to matter with regard to health outcomes. Do you get better or not? Do you get off your diabetic meds? Do you lose weight or not? It doesn't seem to matter. And so I think uh, that's something. And I, and I think this this is something I've been very much, um, you know, I'm a physician. Yeah, yeah, I get that and stuff like that. But I'm, I was new to the carnivore diet at some point. I didn't know. And there's people that have been doing it for longer than me and you and all of us, you know, and these people that, that said, look, you know, we get people that start get start get on there and then they get all gung-ho on organ meats and raw meat. And a year later, they're not around anymore. They just disappear. And it's kind of one of these things where, you know, and, and if we look at some of the major sort of organ meat uh, um, uh, proponents, they are largely have abandoned a car. Right? They're eating, uh, you know, kind of a primal paleo diet, basically. Right? Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. And they added fruit, or and and we didn't even talk about honey, but they added fruit and honey to now get the energy. And it's just maybe you weren't eating enough fat, or maybe you were stressing out your liver with the three, four ounces of liver you're eating every day. If you eat that every day with a little bit of eggs, you are above the upper limit. And we talk about fat soluble vitamins balancing one another. Well, if you look at the nutrient density and profile of a liver, um, I'm not hundred percent sure what kidneys, but vitamin A is super high up there. There's minimal to almost none of D, E, and K. Well, why don't you just eat salmon? They are um, a D and K is beautifully balanced. So all of the arguments that are said about a pro liver, I've done enough research. I would never stand here and say this to my fellow community. Um, if I did not do enough research on this and I can tell you just from my clients, most of them do not eat liver because one way or another, they have felt unwell. And I could tell my parents story four years carnivore. They were uh, metabolically very damaged. Um, my mom was on metformin for 15 years and overweight, asthma at night, all of those things. My dad, high cholesterol, you know, the typical metabolic syndrome, they have zero of that. Um, they went through COVID with even, um, I won't get into that, but they basically are 70, super healthy. Um, they have never had liver. My dad maybe once and he did not like it, but they're fine. They're fine. 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, let's say the 23rd, so in a couple of days, we'll have Ted Naiman on, and he's a big fan of the you know, protein energy thing. He's a high protein guy, and like me, I, I'm a fan of protein. Quite, I'll just be let my bias out there. I, you know, I, I think it supports muscle growth. I think it's important. Yes. He's also said, Hey, I, I've never had liver. I don't eat it. I don't think there's a reason for it. You know, and, 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 and again, he's not on a strict carnivore diet, but he's, you know, relatively carnivorous, I would say, let me ask you a question. So the true, I mean, the, the, the sort of the real realistic situation is not everybody will be a strictly 100% carnivore. There's some that do that and they do that for a long period of time. They're happy and fine. Most people don't. Most people are somewhere 90, 95%, something like that, or they float in and out a little bit. Um, what foods, if you're going to choose something to add back in, then what, what, what do we add back in? Is fruit not a bad, is that a bad decision? Or what, what is the thought on that? What, what would you add? Or what are the safer things you could put back in there based on the limited knowledge we have, I suppose? Yeah, so I, I'm, um, I'm going to release a food toxin database soon. It goes through all the elimination diets. So like AIP, uh, Whole30, uh, FODMAP, there's a bunch of different diets. And then it's all the different anti-nutrients or the, the bigger players since all plants have anti-nutrients. So based on those, I picked 10 for the book. And I know people will argue one, but one of them was like, um, one was bok choy, one was um, uh, broccoli. And I know some people will say, oh my gosh, that's so bad for my thyroid. But there's actually studies that if you add iodine, it's not bad. And the reasons why I picked it is because it's the lowest amount of anti-nutrients. And, um, and then in terms of even glycemic index, if you were to consider people that came to this way of eating, which many people do that have type two diabetes or pre-diabetes, fruit would never be the first one to include. And I know people will often say, well, my CGM shows that I can eat fruit and it's okay. Well, the CGM only measures glucose and fruits are mostly fructose. So that level of fructose will never be measured, only the amount of glucose. So I think actually, dependent on the person, obviously it will really depend, but for the majority of people, the fruit would be the last thing, if ever I would include in a, um, the reintroductions, it would be plants or vegetables first. And I think most people can't handle that. Uh, trigger either just from a weight loss perspective or people that are coming from um, some type of addictive background. I think that's usually a gateway. Same thing when people are trying to eat, add in like keto treats. So people say they're carnivore, but then they have like the keto chocolates or the sugar-free desserts. And I think those are pretty much a gateway to um, spiraling um, or any kind of nuts in that thing. Things that are like dessert-like end up being a spiral for people. And so I know a lot of carnivores end up with like a tomato sauce where that gives them a lot more variety where they can use things that are low carb and zero carb and they'll have those things on uh, occasion or some type of dairy. But really it comes down to like, what can you handle that's not going to cause you to feel bad physically or mentally um, throw mm -hmm. you off track. And so you kind of have to like pick and choose what are those things. I can throw in some pickles or celery and a chicken salad and some red onions and I'm fine, but I can't have peanut butter or it's going to send me to a spiral. So it really just has to be identifying what are those things. Any type of artificial sweetener is going to cause me to have breakouts uh, and then also really increase cravings. So it's almost drilling down onto what are those things. But I, I do think a lot of people are great with being carnivore and having the occasional salad or the occasional vegetable. Those are just, there are things I miss, right? But if you want to have mushrooms with your steak and some butter, like a lot of people are doing really great on those things. So it's, it's not about defining like you're not a carnivore anymore because you had those mushrooms. Now Sean's on mute. I'll just add my two cents in there. I personally never liked vegetables, not as a kid, yeah. never, ever, ever. So I never, I never miss them. I'll just have to say that. So, and I think, I think the point is, you know, I mean, Judy's making, if you're diabetic, that's probably not the best thing is dumping a much more sugar in your system or if you're a, sugar addict, carb addict, or something like that. Those are, those are, those are problems. Let me ask you, you both you guys opinion on this. And there's a couple things I want to ask about. So one is, um, you know, there's this grain finished, grass finished argument. Do you find any Judy? I know you like, the not, I mean, some people are saying, well, you know, if you, eat, if you eat grain finished, you're going to get hormones and antibiotics, which that's really not true because the, the amount is almost none and, and basically none the way they, they manage them. But then there's a concern, well, what about glyphosate? Is it showing up in the fat? Are there other things? And of course there's differences in omega-6 and omega-3 ratios and there's more conjugated linoleic acid and 
grass finish, but there's more monounsaturated fat and grain finish and back and forth and on and on. Thoughts on that? Does it make a big difference? Is it the big, is it the big thing or is it something minor or do we need to just avoid conventional meat like the plague? What do you guys do in practice and what are your, what, what's the thought behind that? Judy and Laura, go ahead. Somebody has to unmute Judy for her, but while, she, while that's happening, I'll share. So our family doesn't eat any of that. First of all, I don't like the taste of it. It tastes very gamey. A lot of grass finished meat tastes um, really dirt. It tastes like dirt. <laughs> I'm not going to eat it. And so that, you know, um, not even a gamey flavor, because I do love some venison, but it's that more grass finished flavor is just not something that I prefer. And it, again, this diet wouldn't be sustainable. And so our family eats exclusively from a grocery store. Um, anytime I do a grocery haul, I'm kind of told like, you should reach out to your local farmer. I don't, I am supporting my local farmer by shopping US beef that's raised in the grocery store. You know, I have a cousin who raises cows in the middle of nowhere, West Virginia. He's not selling to people in his area because there are no people in his area. And I live in Phoenix and there's not local farmers to feed the Phoenix population. So he is selling his beef to a processor who is then finishing that beef and selling it to grocery stores. And I am supporting these small micro farms all across the country by shopping at my local grocery store when I purchase U.S. raised beef. It's healthy for me. If in, you know, I, I would even argue that it's better for the planet because those cows aren't living as long as grass finished cows, which are living like twice as long. This is where Judy and I kind of go back and forth with the, the differences. And I just am strongly standing on the message of the fact that shopping at your local grocery store is supporting your local farmer. It's the best mint you can do for your family. It's the value. It's the price that I can afford. It's the taste that I can uh, enjoy. And I get a little, that's where I get more, more passionate when people talk about the only way to eat is with the grass finished um, from your local farmer. Cause I'm doing that. It's not that it's, it's not that this is a concession of, well, it's all I can afford. I'm shopping at my local grocery store. I am supporting my local farmers around the US, local farmers that don't have access to sell their beef to people, I'm supporting them by shopping at the grocery store. Yeah, before Judy jumps in there, I'll just, I'll just some commentary on that. You know, I, I eat both. I mean, I, I, I saw my dogs are barking. Um, Judy, go ahead and get your answer. I'm gonna okay. wrestle my dogs. In there. <laughs> so um, I think this is a very nuanced um, topic. Uh, so I think from a nutrient perspective, this is what I'll say with the whole PUFAs argument, because I think it really comes into this. I don't think that if you're eating a meat-based diet, that if you were to leave in some of the grain finished pork or the pork that is not just uh, pasture raised, I don't think it moves the needle enough in terms of the PUFAs. I think that is a gross exaggeration from a lot of the information that, I mean, I spoke with Dr. Benjamin Bickman and we talked about insulin resistance. Obviously that is one of the biggest triggers of metabolic syndrome. And he says that the level of PUFAs in, in animals are the most it's such a small thing compared to everything else we're doing. So that nuance, it has been really extrapolated, has been made a lot more scary than it is. And, and I do blood work for people with omega-3 and omega-6 and our red blood cells are pretty good about balancing on their own. So it will decide how much omega-3 versus six will come in the cells. And I see it in my clients. So when I mean, I'd love to see all these advocates that are super, you can only eat pasture, pasture raised pork, uh, have everyone get tested on these things. I mean, they're easy ways to test this data point. And again, a lot of those people don't work with anyone. So I get it in science. It makes a lot of logical sense, but what about the clients? And that's where that's when I will perk up my ears and actually listen. And I don't see that if you add a little bit of fish and it could even be um, farm raised fish, but if you can try to get some salmon in that level of omega threes will counter some of the proof as if we're going to argue that, but it's really the issues of the processed foods and the seed oils that are bringing in the PUFAs and the omega-6. So now in terms of grass-fed versus grain-finished, I've done enough research about it. Um, sacred cow goes into this a lot, but there is not much difference in terms of nutrient density, whether you eat the grain-finished and the grass-finished. So eat the kind you can. And again, Laura and um, Dr. Baker talked about this, but you have to eat the meat that you will enjoy. Otherwise you can't do this long-term. If you are forcing yourself to eat uh, grass finish and it tastes very minerally to you, then you may not be able to do it long-term. Um, but I do think there are some benefits in eating grass finished. Uh, for example, I, I do think it's better for the environment. I do think in a sense um, it is better for the 
quality of the life of the animal, especially at the end of their life. So there are little things, but when it comes to your own health, um, I think when we are trying to heal, I don't think it moves the needle enough. Now I know I have clients that are very, very immune sensitive, have histamines struggle a lot. And they're like, I can only do grass finished. I believe that, but I don't know if it's really the toxin level. I mean, I think we all have some levels of toxins in our bodies and even the animals. I mean, if you have a farm that is organic and pasture raised, but they are right next to a farm that is not, well, when you spray glyphosate, it carries over. So like there, every animal will have some. And the thing is the animals have these tox pathways to also remove some of it. But I think some of those clients, my guess is that you know, the placebo effect is very real. If you believe that if you eat anything other than grass finished, that you will get sick, I assure you, you probably will feel sick. So do I think you need it? No, I don't. Um, I've seen way too many people that are um, from all walks of life, whether they just choose the grain finish because that's what they prefer and taste, or it's because um, they, it's the only thing they can afford. I have seen healing on all grounds. Now, as you are fine tuning your diet and you want to incorporate it, or you want to literally support the, uh, neighbor that you're buying directly from your farmer. <clears throat> I think those are all beneficial reasons to eat the higher quality, but I don't, again, I don't think it's like a mandate. I don't think it's a requirement. I think we should be flexible so that, I mean, wellness should be for all. Uh, those are great points. And again, ultimately, at the end of the day, you can only do what you can do and what's realistic for you. I will, you know, one comment that Laura made, I've had the opportunity, again, I, I get to interface with lots and lots of different ranchers throughout the U.S. and even other parts of the world. And um, I can say with regard to the grass-finished beef, some people do it really well, and it actually tastes pretty darn good. And there's other people who don't do it so well. And I think there's a, there's a learning curve, and I think as more people learn how to properly finish animals out on grass, the taste profile and the, and the, you know, the, the, the marbling gets a lot better and, and it's a skill that's coming in. I can, you know, like, a, like Summerfield farms out of North Carolina does a wonderful job. Some of the best steaks I've ever had. These were grass finished mm -hmm. steaks and they were wonderful. Of course I had the rancher cooking for me in his, in his, in his house, which was, you know, kind of a special treat. But um, I think, you know, the point that about the glyphosate, because, you know, that is something that I, you know, I've seen some studies on how in mammals detoxify glyphosate. It doesn't seem to represent a major problem with storage in their, in their tissues, um, unless somebody has some data that, that goes against that. So, I mean, that's something that I think is more of a theoretical risk than an actual risk. And I think your point, and the point that I've seen is, and Laura is, is a perfect example of, they've gotten healthy eating grain finished meat, and there's, there's nothing wrong with doing it that way, if that's what your preference and that's what your finances can do. I mean, you can... Uh, you know, there are people that certainly I, I bought from a local rancher because there's ranchers. I live in places where there's cows right down. I can walk, you know, two miles and there's cows next to me. So it's very easy for me to do that. But if you're in the middle of Phoenix or some other place, you may not be able to do that. Okay. Another question. So I, I can say, I'm going to have, I'm going to have Ted on next week and he's going to tell us everybody needs to be on a high protein diet and that body composition is the most important metric. And I'm sympathetic to that. I'm certainly a big believer in being strong and fit and lean and athletic, but Here's what I see. I see people, that, particularly people that are diabetic or have diabetic pathophysiology, they try to go higher protein and they see really, really problems with blood glucose. And the question is, is it better to be leaner and, and have less stable blood glucose or is it better to be not as lean and have, you know, I guess better blood glucose control? What, what are your guys' thoughts on, on protein, protein versus fat? What do you do and what are your thoughts? I think in terms of the, um, what you just asked, whether it's lean and then your blood glucose is higher or your, your blood sugar, I think it really depends on their, the whole testing in terms of measuring their cholesterol, their C peptide, their insulin, their glucose, and then determining, is that just a transient number because they ate protein or are they really fine? So I think that will really depend. Um, I think in terms of, this is what I've seen with my clients and I've worked <clears throat> with hundreds of clients at this point. I think that if you are trying to transition from a glucose heavy diet and you are used to your body fueling from glucose, you have to transition the energy source. And then, so if you eat very lean protein and then you're not adding a good amount of fat. And when I say that, I mean about 70% fat. So in a real life example, maybe getting a green finished ribeye and then adding maybe one tablespoon of butter or some fat you can tolerate. That's what I consider 
um, higher fat, at least in the beginning. And then as you eat that way, you're fueling, you're forcing your body to take in more fatty acids. And I know some people get loose stools and stuff, and that's it. Maybe you need some digestive enzymes, but if you can force your body to transition to a more energy source of fatty acids and ketones, then you can figure out what level of fat you want to intake after that. But I think when you start, it makes a lot more sense to consume more fat because one, that's how the animals kind of built, but it gives you more energy in terms of fat because you can't really use protein or it's not the most ideal source of energy in terms of, um, you know, fueling the mitochondria. So it's either going to be glucose or it's going to be fatty acids and you could do protein through, uh, gluconeogenesis, but sometimes for depending on the metabolic health of the person, that whole process is hard for the body. And so in turn, the body starts feeling really fatigued. So I recommend doing higher fat and then you're right. I mean, you're not going to be the thinnest if you are, eating a good amount of fat because calories do matter, right? Energy levels matter. So that's when the person will have to decide they could do extended fasting. Um, but I have seen my clients, the people that heal, especially women with their hormones. Um, I have clients that are amenorrheic. They have to do the high fat for it to resolve and uh, it'll be different for everybody. But for me, my thing is not weight loss. My thing is healing. My thing is that my clients will be able to sleep through the night, have normal stools, normal moods. And that entails oftentimes adding a sufficient amount of fat. And then as your body gets fat adapted, usually you can cut down on the fat, but then again, you're going to find that balance of, are you losing your period? Are you losing your mood? And then you may have to reintroduce more fat. So I am a fan of protein, but I think it should come with good um, levels of fat. I think personally, I, I know my blood glucose does go up when I'm eating really lean protein and I'm not getting enough fat. And the question is like, does that matter? I don't know now that I've been doing this for so long. Um, but from a weight loss perspective, I know that the, I think most women are who are especially doing keto and then somehow come to carnivore are not eating enough protein. And I fell into that camp where I was so worried about my keto macros of getting enough fat. And like all, long before I started carnivore, I was trying to do keto and make sure I had those ketone readings that I was under eating protein. And I started having a lot of hair loss from that. And so then switching to carnivore and increasing my protein really fixed the hair loss issue, uh, over time. And then also just like you said, I mean, I, to be more to have more muscle. Um, we definitely need a lot of protein. I think women have a harder time getting that. I think there was an unfortunate fad that went around in the carnivore community of women eating 80 to 90% fat with like 20% protein. Uh, and so I think that was kind of damaging to a lot of women. And now the pendulum has swung where like the high protein is the thing that everybody seems to be doing. I like that element. I just think that, um, it, it really, most people are going to find this balance between the 60 to 70 maybe 80% fat to protein, right? So you're doing fat, but you're also getting a really good amount of protein. The other extreme of like eating extremely low fat and living on egg whites and chicken breast is certainly not gonna help women with their hormones either. So I I do think most people are, are finding that good ratio with like a steak and maybe a little butter added, but not eating raw fat and not trying to cut it all out of your diet completely. Yeah, I, I think we just have to be, uh, when we talk about high protein, it's a relative term. So if we look at uh, yeah. the standard American diet or most diets throughout the world, most most studies seem to indicate people end up being about 15% protein and then a mixture of fat and carbohydrates to make out the rest of that. And so a carnivore diet, in my view, is generally minimum about 30% protein for most people. If you're eating whole food, you know, meat in particular, it's hard to uh, it's hard to get much fattier than 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 seventy percent fat without having to add. You know, to, to get beyond seventy, like Judy said, the fatty ribeye, which is about the fattiest cut you're going to find, you have to add additional fat in there. And so, and then if you eat anything leaner than that, then you're probably looking more like forty percent protein. Uh, so, what is what is the uh, natural state of hum humans if we were to if we were to say take this back to 150,000 years ago, we're hunting animals and granted the animals were fattier. So we can say that maybe we were eating a lot of ribeye, ribeye steak equivalents when we were eating. There's an interesting book out there written by uh, Boz Edmeads, uh, who I interviewed his son, Ed Edmeads, uh, a while ago. It's called Megafauna, the, 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 the first extinction, human extinction event or something like that, where it's describing how humans basically made the megafauna animals uh, disappear. 
Uh, and it's a pretty compelling argument showing we did that. One, it's very interesting to see the, 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 the sort of the bounty of this wonderful, incredibly monstrous, crazy animals that used to exist, and we exploited pretty much all of them. Uh, but we really focused a lot on tortoises, particularly early on, these early, you know, pre-homo sapien humans. Uh, went after tortoises with with reckless abandon, and these tortoises are pretty fatty. And you know, because their normal defense is to suck their head and their their paw, you know, their their feet and arms and legs in, um, and nothing can get to them typically. But humans, because we had brains and we were able to like flip them over and pry them open with sharp sticks and rocks and whatever, we had access to a lot of this stuff. And early on, we we made those guys go largely extinct from that. That was one of our early uh, meat sources. So. Um, I guess the point of that is that, you know, I think, first of all, e even even when your description of, you know, 20% protein is still relatively high relative standard American diet. Now, I see when you get down to 10%, and I have seen people where they're really limiting their protein down to, you know, I don't know, 40, 30, 40 grams a day and, and, and you know, 200 grams of fat. To me, that's too low for my particular yeah. taste, but yeah. some people do say it's a little better in that way. And I think... Uh, Judy's point of, of you know, and, and this is the thing. When I, even when I, when I wrote my book, if you guys, if you guys read that, the point when I talk about weight loss, I basically said I hate talking about weight loss because this is not what it's about to me. It's about healing, and you know, yeah, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat when it comes to losing weight, you know. But but again, I think when we do talk about weight loss, I think it's important to realize that the, what we lose in that weight loss is extremely important. If you're losing a majority or even a, a, a significant minority of lean mass, and you're probably not doing it the right way. And I think that's yeah. where protein comes into effect. And then again, of course, the biggest driver I think is resistance training. I think that is incredibly important for everybody doing man, women, yes. young, old, doesn't matter what you are, who you are, that is something incredibly important. All right, let me ask you guys, um, you know, uh, Laura, you said your your kiddos eat kind of a carnivorous-ish diet. I mean, that, my kids, same thing. I mean, they eat meat every day, they eat steak. My kid eats steak for dinner every night, eggs for breakfast just about every day. Some other, there's a few other things thrown in there. He has a little bit of fruit. He has a little bit of dairy products and stuff like that. I guess that's a Judy dairy. What's the story on dairy? Is dairy bad? Is it blanket bad for everybody? Are there certain caveats to that? I mean, both of you guys are welcome to chat on that, but I'd like to hear you, Judy's thought on that for sure. Yeah. So it depends again. Um, I know that's annoying, but um, so I think raw dairy is very powerful. Um, I have clients that can't even tolerate raw dairy. So they love it. Their body craves it, but they don't feel well on it. So again, you'll have to figure out what makes sense for you. If you have autoimmune and you have some conditions that are not getting better, then you may want to exclude it for a little bit and see how you feel. If you are stalling in your weight, you may want to remove it and see how you feel. I see a lot of carnivores saying I'm fasting. And so they get coffee and they add, I had one client that would add, um, like a full quart of, uh, of, uh, heavy cream. And, and the next time I saw her, she's like, I I'm gaining so much weight. I don't understand. And I literally thought she was taking one or two tablespoons of the heavy cream, but she was having the whole quart. So um, you can gain weight on carnivore. And so, uh, and I think the, unfortunately our dairy is often very processed. And for some people, like for our family, we do a mix of raw and we do a mix of the ones from the grocery store. But for some people, um, they they do have intolerances to the way that we are processing our dairy. So they may have a sensitivity, um, uh, for some people you're lactose intolerant. So you have to, I think it's really depends on the person. There is so much nutrition in dairy though. So I am a fan in general, but I think we tend to overdo dairy. I think a lot of people come into carnivore, they still want that craveability thing. And so a lot of people end up overeating dairy. I think especially too, just from a, from a, it's the biggest trigger food. I think it's so easy to overconsume. Um, I've found out through lots of trial and error that that's definitely a, a thing for me. I'm never going to cut it out completely. It's just, it's, it's something that I enjoy and it, it works within my life. As long as I keep it with my meals, if I can have cheese on burger patties, or I have some sour cream with the meal, like all those things are fine. It's when I start having it outside of a meal time, it's the easiest thing to like get up now from this session and walk to the fridge and like grab two slices of cheese or grab a string cheese stick. Like those are things where I think it's not helpful and it can be too easy to overeat um, for most people who are dealing with food addiction and, and looking for weight loss. But I think having it with a meal, unless you're having major health issues is usually uh, delicious. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with the deliciousness of that because I, I certainly, you know, like I said, my if this if you come to my house for dinner, 
there's going to be a whole bunch of red meat, something, there's a brisket, there's some ribeyes, there's, you know, whatever I smoke something, I've sous vide something, there's a pile of that. And then usually there'll be some cheeses cut up. Again, this is for the whole family. And usually there's, there's a, and, and they'll have a few pieces of fruit cup, typically an apple or something like that. And I often will find myself eating my steak and I'll grab one or two little bites of cheese in there and just, just to do that from time to time. And I, and I agree it's delicious, but I do like the fact keeping it in the context within the meal um, probably has a, has a role. And, and, you know, like I said, and I've never been, you know, it's kind of funny growing up as a kid, I never liked cheese. I was just like, I just thought it was just gross and I never liked it later in life. I've kind of adopted, but I've never been one to sit down there and just eat cheese by itself. It just never did it for me for whatever reason, but you know, in the context of a meal, yeah, I mean, it's pretty good stuff. Um, let me see what other, what other sort of thought I wanted to have. So, so, um, Judy, let me ask you about, um, you know, we have this sort of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, well, I mean, there's, so there is, uh, and again, I, I like to get your commentary. So there's something called the paleo medicine or, you know, group, the PKD diet, which is high fat, it's carnivore, um, but it's got organ meats. They, they must have organ meats in there to heal people. Are you seeing, and, I, and you know, and, and I've seen, you know, and, 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 I, and I really appreciate the work of Sophia Clemens and Chapa Toth, and I've interviewed them many times. I think they're doing wonderful stuff for the world. And they're, you know, they, they say, well, you know, they're going to get more improvement with that. And, and again, they're treating, in many cases, advanced cancers and some things that, you know, I have no desire to mess with. Um, but in your because you are seeing people and I've, and I've seen people as well, uh, you know, in, in, in basically in the context, context of lifestyle consultations and whatnot, are people able to heal some of these really challenging issues without that, without the organ meats? I mean, and you mentioned, you know, non-liver, non-kidney. So there's obviously pancreas and spleen and mm -hmm. thymus and you know, brain and all that stuff. What, what are your thoughts on the utility of that? And then the other thing, I guess, Judy, because I know you are not afraid to use herbal supplements mm -hmm. where as indicated i believe is that is that, yeah. is that fair statement yes oh um so okay um so with the pkd diet um i during the vitamin a time a lot of people asked me to have um dr clemens on and i asked and they declined so and i get it because i mean if they were to agree with any bit of my vitamin a or copper or any of that concern then it you know it puts a little ding on their protocol. So I understand fully, I believe completely that they are helping certain people, but I also have a handful of clients that have worked with them and now work with me and talk about, um, excess rigidity. And, um, I don't really want to say negative things, but you know, sometimes the excess organs weren't as helpful or that their protein count was so low that their energy was like, they were just subsisting. So there are people that don't fully heal on PKD. I mean, some people do, but there are people that don't. And I work with some of those people. So what I will say is that, sure, I, I fully believe that there are protocols that people will heal on. You can do organs and probably do miraculous, but I do have clients. There are people in the community that have done not so well on that same PKD protocol, meaning that they're not eating enough protein. Um, they're eating super high fat and then they're eating a lot of organs where, um, there was one person where he started developing osteoporosis on that protocol and not to say that it was the protocol that did it, or maybe it was happening um, over time, but that is one thing that happened. So I do think people can heal. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of other things that we need to focus on. You can always do supplementation. If you are missing, for example, beef is really low in thiamine. You can supplement just, uh, B1, there is very, very little B1 even in liver. So I'm not sure where they would get it. If you're not eating pork, pork has the most thiamine that you can get and you need it for metabolic and cellular metabolism. B1 is such a deficiency in a lot of our diets. And so I'm not opposed if you get a high quality B1 temporarily as you try to rebalance your body. I'm fine with that. Um, I don't think that you need to get it from organ meats because again, there are balances with the level of health that you can get and, or even harm. Um, yeah. And I think, I think people just need to figure out what makes sense for them, but it's the thing is um, there are so many different thoughts in the carnivore space or meat based space and not one protocol is going to work for everybody. So people need to figure out what is working. And it's actually true that 
a PKD or an AIP or a uh, nose to tail may not work for you. And that's okay. You don't have to do it harder. Just try some other variety, find it where the most important thing is finding consistency and then also reducing our stress levels. Uh, the stress is absolutely a pandemic right now in terms of causing our cortisols to rise and then causing issues within our body. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I know we're running out of time, but I was hoping you could touch one other issue for me. And then I want you to share your guys is, you know, how to get a hold of you and connect to you and tell us what your podcast and that stuff. But, um, you know, Amber O'Hearn, who I, I have a great deal of respect for, I think she's done some really great work within the carnivore space. She's been doing this for now, I think 12 or 13 years. And is very, I think, very cautious in, 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 in how she presents data. And she's very much willing to back up what she says. She wrote an article that was published in an evolution, I think an evolutionary science journal, journal. She had a scientific paper studied on, you know, published on the carnivore diet. And the only nutrient of concern that she says she's not sure about was calcium. What are your thoughts on calcium? Do we have to have dairy to get calcium? Do we, do, or do we need to do like bone meal powder and chew up eggshells or what's the story on calcium? Can we get enough on a carnivore diet? So the, um, oftentimes people have low calcium, not because of calcium, but because of the cofactors in my nutritional therapy school, I remember distinctly, there were seven cofactors. I can't remember all of them, but usually it's a balance of other things. So do we need excess calcium? I don't think so. Um, I don't supplement calcium. My kids don't supplement calcium. You can get it from dairy. If you're not doing dairy, you can always eat like sardines with the bones intact, I know there are people that clean eggshells and do the bone meal. You can do that. I have clients that have osteopenia. I can tell you that the way that they, and so they were heading towards osteoporosis and they had osteopenia and then they are essentially reversing their bone health. And the way they're doing is they're not taking calcium whatsoever, but they're having bone broth daily and they're eating plenty of meats and fats. A lot of times our minerals balance one another. So your calcium can be in balance because of your sodium levels or your potassium or your magnesium. So it's usually something else and it's not the specific calcium. And oftentimes if you are supplementing just one mineral, when you don't know for sure, if that's the issue, you're going to just exacerbate the situation why calcium is low anyway. So these are all concerns. Um, I don't, I rarely ever recommend supplementing calcium. It's Sometimes for some fa uh, fast metabolic people, they might need it, but then I'll recommend doing a little bit of sardines with bones um, or some dairy. And then, yeah, I don't, I don't really think, um, I think for bone health, a better option is if you're going to supplement is to do like um, K2, MK7 or MK4. Yeah, I just, I just, and sorry, I'll just jump in there. Uh, we know from the studies, there used to be this acid ash hypothesis where we saw that uh, high protein diets led to hypercalcuria or calcium in the urine. The assumption was it was causing it to be pulled from the bones. That turned out not to be true. And the fact was that high protein diets end up causing you to absorb more calcium and, and it's just made up for it. And that's why great. And the other thing is, as you know, as you well know, there's a lot of anti nutrients that bind calcium. So we right. prevent the absorption. We eliminate the anti nutrients, you're eating high protein diet. And then, of course, the other cofactors that you'd mentioned. And, and yeah, as you point out, there are many of them. If those things are in line, you're probably not going to get a calcium deficiency. And I, it's interesting that someone who most people would boo when you say their name, but Walter Willett, the, the you know the Harvard uh, PhD uh, you know epidemiologist, has basically said that he thinks that the cal calcium requirements RDA are wi wildly over overestimated as a, as a push to get people away from dairy. But I think there's some truth to that physiology. All right, I unfortunately have to go in one minute. So Judy, Laura, tell us how to find you guys, and thank you so much. This has been awesome, wonderful, and keep up the great work. We have a podcast called Cutting Against the Grain, and we really, we don't do a lot of interviews. We really just try to have more discussions and talking about the science, but then also how do we incorporate it into real life and find that balance. Sean, kind of as a fun fact, Judy and I both have two kids who do jujitsu full-time now, and my husband's now uh, super into it. So we kind of just talk about like how we're living our lives, topics that are going on in the community, our perspectives, and really how you can adapt, um, how you can make all of this work in your normal life with you know with the context of all the science she explains a lot of things to me that i don't understand <laughs> i think our i think the value of our podcast really is that there's a balance of you know we talked about the fruit and liver 
debate, right? We talked about certain things and we just talk about nuance that's really hard to capture on social media. We hear, here's the safest fruits, but I mean, uh, plant foods to uh, reintroduce, but there's no conversation about it or we'll have people tried it and what do they feel? And so we talk about being able to incorporate a meat-based diet into your real life, what that looks like, what are our struggles as much as we're advocates for it. We're not saying our diets are perfect. And it's a, just another support for our meat-based community that shares real life, real talk, and also how we can fine tune certain things with a little bit of science. You can also find me on platforms as nutrition with Judy, but Laura, you should share also. <laughs> Just look for Laura Spath on YouTube or, or Instagram. My right, guys, thumbs up for the jujitsu, by the way. All right, guys, I got to go. Thank you so much. The rest, of you crew, the rest of the crew, I'll be back tomorrow. You guys have a great day. Thanks. Laura, Judy, keep up the good work for what you're doing. Bye-bye, guys. Thanks. Bye, Take everyone. Care. Join Rivero.Health for a 30-day free trial to get access to live Q&A with VIP guests, social community meetings, member discounts, low-carb healthcare providers list, forum, workouts, monthly challenges, early access to podcasts, recipes, carnivore diet guide, fasting guide, shred guide, and much more.